Department of Architecture this quarter. Uh, there are two things that will always stand out in my mind uh, about uh, McKelly. Uh, number one, a, year, um, a week after he arrived in Muncie, he was the proud owner of a 1976 um, blue pacer, which he described to his two children as being a moon mobile. So he quickly assimilated, and it gave me an opportunity to go down Madison Street with McKelly and talk to the various used car salesmen, which is an experience that you should all have. We walked in and we said, do you have anything under $1,000? And uh, the expression is really priceless in most, in most cases. Um, the second one is that McKelly now is a proud owner of flannel shirts and corduroy pants, and therefore he has been quickly Americanized. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have McKelly on our faculty, and this picture obviously does not do him justice. He is not a hit man. He is from northern Italy, not from Sicily. So um, uh, I want you to know that that picture, this is the real gentleman right here. Uh, Michele has, a, um, has an engineering degree from the Politecnico in Milano in 73 and then received a master's degree from Sheffield University in England in 1974. Uh, he has been a project engineer with Kimura Asso uh, Architects and Associates in Tokyo, Japan and was a lecturer for four years at the University of Nottingham in England where he also was a partner in the firm of Archilab. He has entered numerous competitions and was awarded first prize in the 1975 Royal Institute of British Architects Design Competition Focus on the Center, which was an urban redevelopment project for the center of uh, Liverpool. Um, Michele will be sharing with us his practice in uh, Perugia and some of his projects. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Michele Cuini. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, I luckily I didn't use that poster to advertise my second uh, hand pacer for sale. <laughs> but anyway, it is for sale, so if somebody's interested, uh, they can contact me after the lecture. No. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> well, um, this lecture has been advertised as, uh, with the title of Current Practice. Uh, in fact, I would like to talk also about my research, which I started at Sheffield University um, and continued at Nottingham University, and I would say also continued dur during my years in practice. Um, when I was a student, I was very much interested in, um, in ideas in architecture and in trying to find out uh, how uh, architectural forms are generated and also how people perceive architectural forms. And uh, therefore I decided to use uh, housing as a vehicle for this type of research because uh, um, first of all housing makes up a very big part of our cities, our urban environment. So in quantitative terms it's very important. But also, it's a building type which uh, uh, relates very much to the way people live and the way people perceive their environment. Um, also, in those years, in Europe and particularly in, um, in England, uh, there was a good deal of, of um, social, social research going on in, in the housing field. Uh, because of the great amount of uh, public housing which was provided, was being provided and built. Um, and this ob obviously um, was a, uh, a material which uh, could have been studied to relate uh, housing form and architectural forms in general to uh, people's perception uh, of space uh, and people's needs. So, uh, right. I found out that uh, during the, uh, you see, I, I started doing this research for my Master of Arts at Sheffield in 1973. And uh, by that time, 
there were a lot of examples in Britain of uh, low-cost housing built with prefabricated systems. Um, and uh, housing and social research was being done on these building types, uh, studying um, sometimes uh, trivial things uh, which didn't relate to the urban forms of these developments, um, such as the arrangement of furniture inside the flats or comparing uh, one tower block with another in terms of people's preference. And uh, it was very apparent that uh, the, uh, the social, this type of social research uh, was missing the, the major point, which was instead clear if one looks at what the private market was offering for sale. Uh, if you look at the picture on your right, you'll see uh, a typical example of, uh, of private uh, housing development in Nottingham in the early 70s. And uh, this, uh, this type of dichotomy uh, was in fact just uh, stigmatizing people uh, forced to live in public housing schemes. So it was the, an environment which the uh, low-income people didn't like. It felt very alien to their own uh, uh, cultural background, to, to their own uh, uh, style of living. Now, when a Briton thinks of, uh, of a house, uh, he has in mind a very clear uh, image, very few uh, simple characteristics, such as the brick walls, um, the pitch roofs, and the Georgian windows, sometimes Georgian porches. And uh, um, I started looking at the, at the various theories which dealt with people's perceptions of the environment and also architectural the theories which dealt um, with social implications, psychological implications of design. Now, there was a theory which I found uh, very popular at the time, at least very influential, among others, um, very typical also of those times. The uh, theory uh, worked out by the Dutch architect Nicolas Habraken. Now, Habraken was very much concerned with the problem of uh, mass housing or public housing in uh, Holland and other North European countries, um, which uh, produced a very monotonous, very anonymous type of urban environment, not at all liked by people. Um, he suggested that in order to create this variety which uh, uh, was lost in modern cities, we should find ways of reintroducing uh, people, the dweller, as the driving force behind the design of their own living environment and, and behind the transformation, the development uh, of this environment. And um, um, his theory was based on a, on, a, on a very simple conception. The idea that there should be a, a, a support structure or, or what he called supports uh, provided by um, the local authority provided by public finance or provided even by the public market, but sorry, the private market, but uh, which would allow people to uh, insert their own independent dwelling elements, some form of, uh, uh, of building components which people could buy in the private markets and use to shape their own dwellings according to their own needs. And uh, uh, in order to make this theory work, um, Bracken devised also a design method, as it was fashionable in the late 60s. There were lots of design methods. And he called this method the zones and margins. It was, um, just cutting it short, a way uh, to define areas within this support structure, uh, within this 
basic structure shell where you could locate uh, services or, or living spaces. Um, the, uh, there were lots of variations of this idea um, of what is basically the concept of, the concept of, of a flexible dwelling. There were many proposals of flexible dwellings, of adaptable dwellings, of evolutionary housing. Um, they were all relating to this problem of uh, letting people participate, introducing users, per users participation in shaping their own environment. Um, again, a theory which uh, dealt with uh, the single dwelling, the shape of the dwelling, but didn't uh, really um, change drastically the way the urban environment was conceived because the um, urban spaces, the urban structures depended very much on the, the design of the support structures which uh, in, in, for the design of, of uh, and for the design of these people were not uh, supposed to be consulted. Um, still, I think these theories uh, made some very important points from a theoretical, from a conceptual point of view. Um, first of all, the idea that there are um, uh, separate elements in housing, and I would say in, uh, in architecture in general, in general which uh, um, are subject to different cycles of change in time, um, which relate um, to uh, different types of needs, which relate to different uh, um, social groupings, the support structures, Advised by Habrak, and we're clearly referring to um, uh, the needs of, of a social group of, or of society at large, while the elements related to the dwelling were clearly belonging to the single family or to a smaller social group. Now, this uh, concept of, uh, of a hierarchy of uh, architectural elements is not, uh, wasn't new even at that time. Um, Le Corbusier had uh, thought something similar in the 1920s. Uh, by, uh, you see the, the sketch on, on your right uh, suggests that uh, the, uh, there is a basic urban infrastructure made up of uh, utilities and services. Uh, there is a a load-bearing structure which supports the dwelling. And then uh, the dwelling, as he would uh, make clear, clearer later in his uh, project for the Unité d'Habitation, could be uh, something um, even built independently from this load-bearing structure. Um, now, the idea of, uh, of this hierarchy of uh, building elements can be found also outside these modern theories of architecture. And uh, in the Japanese house, for instance, uh, it's a very traditional, uh, it's a very traditional way of designing the house by starting with a primary structure which uh, do not relate to the functional planning of, of the house, uh, but only to its main characteristics, uh, the basic size of the house, the shape of the roof, uh, but it's mainly dictated by uh, the regional tradition. And then within this primary structure, uh, you can add uh, secondary structures for uh, uh, supporting floors, for uh, window frames, uh, for party walls, and then another set of uh, secondary elements, which are the sliding doors, the sliding windows, which relate to uh, daily use or, uh, or are in general components which are subject to faster change for the purposes of maintenance or, uh, or uh, transformations in the use of the house. 
So you can see that there are, in, uh, also in history of architecture, there are different fields of architecture. Um, um, uh, things which uh, uh, helps to reinforce this idea that architecture can be analyzed in terms of separate sets of, uh, of elements. And the, the other thing I would, uh, um, I was led to think, uh, considering particular examples such as the Japanese house, is how, uh, in fact, the sets of elements relate to different uh, uh, to different social groups and also uh, how uh, each of these sets is used uh, uh, differently uh, in, in each culture. In other words, there is a, a connection between um, culture of society, culture of, of the individual and a certain set of architectural elements. Uh, I think this point was made uh, quite clearly in one of the projects that Christopher Alexander did in Peru um, for a housing competition. Um, he designed uh, some low-cost housing which Peruvian people could uh, build by themselves for the self-help project. Uh, but he first of all devised uh, a grid of roads which relate to the, um, uh, to the uh, needs of society at large of that particular social group of people. And within this uh, grid which related to society, then individual families could build uh, the dwelling units according to their own needs. Similar uh, dwelling types changing in some details, such as the size of, of the rooms, the number of the courtyards. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, as, as Alexander described it, it's like uh, different leaves uh, stepping out from a, from a branch of the same tree. Historically, um, the, uh, this uh, urban infrastructure has been generated by reasons we perhaps have lost in our memory. Uh, the meaning, for instance, of the Indianapolis grid is not uh, any longer apparent to the people who live, who live in Indianapolis. Now, you have similar uh, situations in Europe where you might live in a town uh, planned on a Roman grid and that Roman grid has no uh, clear meaning for the people living there uh, in our time. Still, it's something which has remained um, as a very strong physical feature of the place. It's very strongly associated with the character of, of a certain place. So, um, the other important consideration is that uh, um, while uh, a certain uh, type of urban structure uh, or a housing structure uh, has a well-defined meaning for the people who build it, then this meaning can be lost in time or can change. And um, this has happened. Sorry, I need to go back. This has happened um, in the historic cities of Italy, quite clearly also with monuments such as the Roman theaters and amphitheaters. Uh, these are buildings which uh, uh, had a, cl a clear purpose, a clear function in Roman times, and uh, then were abandoned uh, at the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, were even transformed into a completely different you uh, put into put into completely different uses, uh, particularly housing. 
they became inhabited by people. People used them as uh, primary structures in the sense that they were, uh, were load-bearing structures, really, defining an urban space. And this space became used for, for a, a habitation and sometimes for workshops. There were projects to convert these buildings into hospitals or even churches. Uh, this is a quite, uh, uh, you see on the right, the uh, Teatro Marcello in Rome, uh, which is still today uh, inhabited, in fact, on top floors. Uh, on the left uh, is the Colosseo, which has uh, been restored, sort of brought back to what is supposedly, so, uh, at least partly, its original form. Uh, so, again, it's a meaning, the meaning of the Colosseo today is certainly different from what it was in the Roman times. We attribute to the Colosseo, to the Colosseum, a historic meaning. We keep it as a, as a monument, as a historical reminder of, of the past. Um, for people who had transformed the Colosseos, the other theaters, into dwellings, Again, the historic uh, character of it was not important. It was important to use to use it as a utilitarian for utilitarian purposes. Now you see uh, two other examples of these uh, uh, transformations of. Uh, of uh, basic urban structures, basic urban forms, like the city walls. City walls are very strong elements to define urban form. Uh, on the left in Perugia, you see how the Etruscan wall, again, has been used for, uh, for uh, uh, building uh, dwellings at the top, lodges. You see the, on the right, the another Roman amphitheater in Spoleto, which again has been converted into uh, dwellings. So a, a change of meaning uh, of these uh, primary urban forms, which has led also to a change of architectural character. And I think in architectural form, it's very important to analyze this combination of form and meaning. I think it's the meaning which, uh, uh, together with the form, makes up what we can call architecture. Um, Pesner has given a, uh, what is now a classical definition of, uh, of architecture, it's something designed with an aesthetic intention uh, I think uh, one should add to the intention of the designer also the meaning that uh, this form has for people. Uh, as we can say, that as, as the meaning changes, also the, uh, the perception of a certain form as an architectural form changes. It's interesting to um, observe what happened in times when uh, uh, strong cultural changes took place, such as um, at the end of the Roman ages and at the beginning of the uh, early Christian period. Uh, the Christians had a completely different attitudes towards the, the world and towards architecture from the Romans, while they while Roman architecture expressed the uh, eternity and absolute power of the Roman government, uh, for a Christian there was nothing uh, permanent and absolute of what man could build. So uh, some uh, uh, Roman building types, as the Basilica, uh, you see one on the, on the left, the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, uh, was a re-elaboration of, of a Roman building for basically the purposes of uh, 
of assembling a Christian congregation. Uh, I think wherever it was possible, the early uh, Christians or the early medieval periods, um, there was no attempt to uh, copy uh, Roman uh, architecture, to copy classical forms. Uh, the, uh, the attempt, the, 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 as you can see on the on the square of Assisi here on, on your right, uh, there is a Roman temple sitting on the square, which was uh, originally the Roman Forum. And what the medieval builders did was to build something completely different. So the the classical architecture, the classical forms, had no uh, absolute meaning for them. Now it's interesting to try to understand how uh, meanings become associated with forms, with architectural forms. I, I, um, I think that the, uh, this happens in two ways, basically. One is by convention. And, uh, people use of a, of a certain form. People get accustomed to see some forms used, used in a certain way. Um, I showed recently a picture of the Pantheon here on the left to some uh, uh, elementary school children. And one girl said, well, that looks like a bank to me. And uh, that why it's, it's a very appropriate comment in the sense that she, she has experienced probably uh, some bank buildings using that type of image. So that's an, uh, it's, it's an association of images which uh, has taken place by conventional use of a certain architectural language, of certain set of architectural forms. Uh, the other way is to attribute uh, a certain value to architectural forms. When, for instance, the, uh, in the late 18th century or early 19th century, uh, uh, architects revived the Greek style, that was done for, uh, for uh, uh, precise purpose, for precise reasons. It was a, an ideal value attached to Greek architecture. It represented um, some political or moral values which uh, they felt uh, uh, important to uh, reassess uh, at that time. Now, there are some Buildings again, another another different uh, uh, situation of social change, of cultural change, between the end of the uh, 19th century and the beginning of this century. Um, you see on uh, on your right uh, this neoclassical building in Chicago, seen through the uh, glazing of Miss Van der Rohe's post office of, of, of the Federal Plaza. Uh, it's interesting to note how this building is made up of a, basically of a frame of uh, classical columns and, uh, and uh, eaves. And uh, that opened the way to uh, uh, the new uh, merge of uh, steel frames with classical style and classical decorations typical of uh, later architecture. I think the, this building here on the, on the left in St. Louis is, a, is a, an interesting example of this, not because it's, it is a particularly well designed perhaps, but uh, it shows the uh, merging of two different cultures, two different uh, type of needs. The, the necessity of relating with a classical frame uh, to something socially acceptable, using a language which was known uh, 
uh, and shared by everybody. And then the need of, uh, uh, in fact, uh, responding to new social and economic forces to have larger spans inside the buildings for office space or, or warehouses. Uh, to me, this type of architecture is not only interesting from, for, uh, uh, as an historic example, but also as a, uh, a symbolic, a conceptual statement of how, in fact, architecture could be thought in terms of uh, uh, a basic set of elements, which, as I said before, in housing relates to social, uh, social values, to commonly shared values. And how within uh, this uh, primary set of forms one could accommodate individual needs. Um, I was fascinated by another building of the same type, something which, uh, uh, well, in a classical building still, if you like, something which you wouldn't find certainly in Italy. This is New Zealand Chambers in London by. Uh, Richard Norman Shaw. Uh, again, the interesting thing is to note this giant order, uh, which makes up a, a basically classical frame. And within this frame, you see large elements of glazing inserted with a very eclectic type of decoration. Uh, and I, I tried to separate by coloring this. Glazed elements with different colors, and trying to suggest the idea that these elements would, in fact, uh, be replaced and changed and be very different from each other in a way that would express um, the uh, changing requirements and the changing needs of the individuals using the building. So it's a uh, it's a combination of two layers of architectural elements, two layers of meanings. The, the public uh, facade and uh, uh, the expression of the individual. Now, the initially, um, going back to the housing field, um, there are not just monuments in the cities, not just the Colosseum or the Roman theaters, which are very uh, strong urban form determinants. But the, the city center as a whole, the historic center of towns, has been recognized as one value to maintain, as something you can't separate into between monuments to save and minor buildings to redevelop or to destroy. Uh, it's one uh, entire, uh, the, the entire city center, the entire urban form uh, is a value in itself since it reminds of our cultural past, since it's the result of a, of a collective effort. Uh, it's, a, it's considered to be almost a, a collective work of art. Therefore, uh, whatever needs to be rebuilt uh, it's, uh, uh, relates very strongly to the existing context or to the uh, type of uh, you know, respect the street lines and the formal characteristics of what was there before. Now, when uh, Certainly, within uh, this uh, pattern of streets, within these uh, shells of old buildings, uh, people need to change uh, the, to make changes, to change the services, technical services, uh, to replace finishings, to change the, uh, the dwelling units. So the there is, in fact, a continuous process of conversion and transformation. Uh, you can see this, uh, what happened in Bologna, uh, when 
uh, they found out a way to um, employ uh, public finance for low-cost housing in the city center. And uh, uh, these buildings were virtually rebuilt uh, as they were in their uh, basically 19th century form, uh, as far as the street facade is concerned. Then they all changed inside in terms of structures and uh, subdivision of dwelling units and uh, technical services. And uh, housing rehabilitation has become a major source of work for architects, not just in Italy, but uh, in Britain and in many European countries. And I was also involved in a, in a rehabilitation project, which in fact started uh, with a fish and chip shop here in an area near the University of Nottingham. Uh, the Nottingham City Council had served a um, clearance order for this area. It means that the houses had to be demolished and there were no plans to rebuild anything um, in this area. So the, uh, the residents formed a, uh, an action group uh, which was in fact uh, organized around the owner of the fish and chip shop. Uh, and that served as a sort of basis for the operation of the, of the residence group. And we were called in, um, my British partner David Nicholson Cole and I were called in as consultants for setting up a, uh, a campaign and providing a technical expertise to demonstrate that the housing could be saved together with the, the small community and the, the uh, neighborhood economy, so to speak, which uh, uh, was basically uh, meant saving the fish and chip shop. If you had a chip, the fish and chip shop was uh, lost, then it wouldn't be, uh, would be a small business lost forever. Uh, there was no way to replace it in, uh, in a new, new housing development. And um, so we presented the case at the public inquiry, and we won the case, and the area was eventually saved. Although the, uh, the story had a sort of strange, bitter end, in a way, because the, the decision of the Department of Environment in favor of, the, of uh, rehabilitating the area came so late that in the meantime, people had already gone and had already been uh, persuaded by the council to leave the area, uh, but still we managed to, to save the fish and chip shop. And um, we in fact uh, uh, used the same techniques for uh, saving another area in Nottingham Castle Boulevard, uh, where these roads were, some of the roads of uh, this Victorian housing were pulled down to create uh, um, open spaces and some others were saved by the usual British techniques of adding uh, this kitchen and, uh, and bathrooms blocks at the back. What we did at the time was not to provide a detailed um, uh, architectural service, but to provide information and, um, and support for each resident uh, in order to use the, um, the grants for rehabilitation of these housing units and uh, in order to be able to cost all uh, steps of the rehabilitation, uh, to cost the uh, central heating, the addition of a new bathroom or a new kitchen and so on and so forth. And we produced some manuals also for other residents groups um, which uh, uh, had the benefits of, of a social assistance in each cases and uh, of a community center where to hold the meetings. And we, we started uh, <clears throat> using these um, cases as students' projects, um, very often together with the Department of Planning of, of Nottingham University. Uh, we set up a, a project for our third-year students um, in, in a 
which had as the objective a way of uh, devising the way to let people participate in the design process from uh, side layouts to the design of their individual dwelling. Uh, we set this project up with uh, Dr. Tony Gibson, who was from the Department of Environment uh, in London, who acted as a consultant for it. And, uh, and we built a set of uh, various sets of models. One set uh, was for planning the, uh, the area within the neighborhood. Uh, a second set dealt with the grouping of houses, and the third set uh, dealt with the planning of the, of the dwelling unit itself. And you see there on the right, one of our third year students discussing with the, one of the residents. Now we, uh, sorry about these slides are not very good, but it's, uh, um, I took them very quickly uh, before leaving. Um, since it's a, these are, these are quite new drawings we are doing in, uh, in our Perugia office for a rehabilitation scheme. And this is just to say that uh, these rehabilitation schemes are very interesting because you deal with people. On the other hand, it is very difficult to deal with people when people are living in the units. Um, and you've got to find ways to move them out and then bring them back again which is a very long and expensive process. Going back to this. Okay. Um, we did as uh, one of the first projects of the Perugia office about five years ago, uh, our little urban transformation within a, a major urban transformation. Um, this is a fortress on the, the coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, which has been uh, uh, bought by a developer and converted into a luxury condominium. So inside the, these buildings you see in the pictures, there are in fact uh, a number of uh, of uh, apartments used for mainly for the tourist season for summer holidays and um, our project was located in this building here and uh, there was a huge barrel vaulted space and the owner wanted to increase the uh, usable space within it so the logical uh, decision was to build a mezzanine floor um, as a bedroom space and uh, uh, so we we saw the problem really as inserting a secondary structure within a main structure which had the monumental character therefore a very important meaning to be uh, not just to be saved but to be enhanced uh, by using this, this contrast of the new elements and the old ones and we decided to put up a structure uh, uh, made up of a main uh, timber truss, which was prefabricated in Perugia in a small workshop, there, and uh, pre-assembled in Perugia, and then dismantled and reassembled on site. It was very, you see the pre-assembly stages on the left, and now it was finally assembled on site. Uh, oh, that's on the on the right. You, you may recognize Alcatraz. That could be a, a very interesting project for your students uh, for a, another type of urban transformation into luxury condominiums. Well, it's in San Francisco, it's a prime area. Um, we we face we this we. I had a very interesting project in the office for some years now, um, dealing with a problem of uh, how to, to build uh, a new context, or how to relate with the, uh, to, a, to a very strong historical context uh, with a new development. 
in the sense that we um, uh, we had to to build um, a tourist village as an expansion of this uh, hill town in Tuscany, which is close to the sea. And the, the addition was, in fact, a new village in itself. Now, this is an idea which my partner, and my Italian partner, uh, Giorgio Ceccarelli, developed, in fact, before we set up in practice. And then in, in, um, in Perugia, we developed quite a lot of architectural drawings for this. And we discussed this theme quite at length, um, how to relate to a strong historic context, such as you find uh, in Tuscany, in the middle of uh, these hill, small hill towns. And the basic idea here is to um, build around a central space, which represents the traditional uh, piazza of Italian of, uh, <coughs> Tuscany hill towns, built along the contours, um, using that imagery of the cascade of roofs, which is very familiar to everybody who lives there. And uh, you can see a plan of that, how the uh, residential units are uh, designed on a, on a regular module of about five meters span across this side, and then uh, they're standardized in the sense that there are uh, six basic types, six or seven basic types, which are used along the contours in order to produce a fairly complex form. This is a, a model which we produced for the developer uh, for marketing reasons, and then he discovered that there wasn't a market, so he froze the projects and he also froze our fees. Um, um, a similar theme was uh, uh, tacked in this competition, which we entered in, uh, for a, <clears throat> a site in Foligno, which is a small medieval town near Perugia. Um, Foligno, uh, quite unlike most other Italian medieval cities, is uh, on a flat side, site. It's along a river. And um, there is a, an area which interested us quite a lot, this area here. It's a medieval expansion, and therefore has a regular grid and a quite distinct character from all the rest of the city center. And of course, the, there are these interesting features such as the uh, medieval wall along the, along the river and uh, all the potentialities of being on a, on a river bank. And we, we did this uh, competition as a team with our two other architects who dealt very much with the um, historical studies of the area in terms of uh, urban patterns, urban form, um, urban elements, which uh, made up the uh, recognizable features of the townscape the pattern of historical development. And, and our solution was uh, included the studies for rehabilitating old existing housing and for inserting uh, a new block of, uh, of dwellings in an area which had been bombed during the war was used uh, it is used at the moment as mainly as a car park within the medieval walls. So our suggestion was to clear the site from the car parking, put the car parking outside, and, uh, and use the area for housing, for, uh, yes, for housing as a residential, mainly residential block. Um, now, this, see, the, the response to a context uh, obviously starts from the premise that uh, one recognizes the value of the historic city, of the historic center uh, as such, as one uh, entity which has to be preserved with uh, its own peculiar character. It's a value in itself. But in addition to, to saving the historic sites, the historic town, 
you, hold, you also have to respond to, to the new values of society. Uh, people living in modern houses um, want also to have a car. Uh, they want to have houses which are uh, earthquake resistant, which have, all, of course, all the modern uh, technical services. So the, the resulting form is never a precise imitation of, of what uh, you find uh, in the past. But our basic concept was to uh, pick up the, this, the basic structural pattern of the existing medieval houses, which is based, again, on a, on a pattern of party walls uh, about uh, between four and five meters, and varying heights, um, the existence of, uh, of tower-like elements, like these lodges, and we tried to repeat. Uh, we use the same structural module on party walls all along uh, the new uh, along the new development. And we inserted also traditional elements which you can find in uh, in other parts of the same quarter, such as these courtyards, uh, balconies. Um, the important thing was to reintroduce the car to, to make possible. Uh, for people to have the car close to their dwelling. So the, the ground floor of this um, is, is, a, is a garage. And we were exploiting, in this case, the, the possibilities offered by the site, which was sloping, uh, so that we could uh, uh, have the garage entrance from the street side and then uh, bank the, the river side against it. So you basically have uh, the dwelling starting at ground level on this side, and all the garages on the street side, intermixed with uh, entrances to the uh, to the uh, dwellings above. See this. Um, you can see these sections, in fact, which explains this concept better. You have the, the garage entrance on the street side, and then at the, uh, on the side of the river, you have entrances to other flats. And the, the system of entrances is devised in a way that you, you don't have to go up for more than two floors to reach each unit. Um, we did also another competition for the same uh, town, Foligno. This time was a different, different theme, was the, um, the reconstruction of an area uh, behind this facade. This was a 19th century theater bombed during the war. And uh, you see at the back of the theater, there's nothing left. There is an empty site, which is used again as a car park. And the council wanted to have some ideas on how to, what to do with that empty site. Um, there were proposals to, uh, where they proposed either the reconstruction of a theater or of a sort of public space. And we um, opted for the idea of uh, putting a theater back there, because we thought that the site was too important. And um, <clears throat> the the starting point was, uh, first of all, the, a way to link the um, old facade with the new building, both in, uh, in uh, an architecture and a functional way, in the sense that the old entrance should serve as the new entrance, uh, or the, as, as the entrance for the new building. At the same time, we had to relate to very strong constraints uh, because of the anti-earthquake legislation. So we had to keep far apart from the existing buildings. And in order to locate the theater in the building, we decided to put it underground. And that's why you know, there is an underground theater here. And that's why there is a, this large uh, opening above it uh, without any structural element. And this serves as a sort of extension to the piazza were created on one side. 
the architectural language employed here tries to relate to the uh, medieval context of Foligno, where you have medieval cathedrals uh, or the, the basilica type uh, with uh, a, long, a long central nave and uh, this long roof and uh, timber trusses and uh, round windows. You can see quickly. In fact, it's a building which uh, needs to be seen in section to, to be understood. And that's a theater underneath. This is the long section. And the enclosed piazza on the top. And uh, a museum space, an exhibition space above. And you see in the section, you, the, the auditorium, in fact, is wider than the short section of the building. So again, a, a mixture of... Uh, um, historic elements and, and new technology. Um, I had studied the theme of the theater before uh, in England for another competition I did with my partner, uh, British partner, in uh, Liverpool. This was the competition uh, Tony referred to before, Focus in the Center, was an ideas competition uh, in order to rebuild a part of the city center in here, uh, which was an uh, empty derelict site. But th the site was very interesting, not just because uh, it was in the center of Liverpool, but because it was fu full of memories. First of all, the environment uh, was made up of beautiful Victorian warehouses old industrial buildings which uh, uh, were very underused and decaying. And also because the, on the site um, there was once the cave, the, the nightclub where the Beatles started their career in Liverpool. So full of, uh, the site was linked to these uh, memories of the Beatles and pop music. There, there was also a strange uh, place called the Liverpool School of Language, Music, and Pun, run by a guy who was a, a uh, follower of Carl Jung. And we learned from this, uh, from this guy that uh, Carl Jung had uh, written uh, his memories, a book called Memories. And he described how uh, searching uh, for his ego, one night he had a dream, and he dreamed that he had uh, ended up in Liverpool in the center of Liverpool, and on a plateau he had, uh, he had, had a vision, a glowing uh, tree, uh, which uh, according to the inter Young's interpretation of his own dream represented itself. So Liverpool was uh, you know, a, very, a very important place in, uh, in Carl Jung's life because it symbolized, symbolized the uh, reaching of, uh, of his self. And uh, in this area, uh, there were lots of also, also ethnic groups performing festivals. Liverpool is a place full of Chinese people. Um, there was the Carl Jung Festival celebrated there with strange happenings. So one, a typical feature was, a, was somebody uh, diving from a window into a vat full of banana custard and the sort of eccentric, eccentricities. So we were... Um, Now, we, we suggested that the, um, the site should, shouldn't be developed with a building, but basically with an infrastructure which could serve to generate, to generate all sorts of activities. First of all, uh, music events, obviously tied to the Beatles, if they could ever get together again, because at, the, at that time, we were in 1970, Nine, I think, and uh, John Lennon was still alive. Um, also, it would serve as a telecommunication center, communication center with a heliport on the top, and the structure itself. See, the structure itself was a, a basic shed, a steel shed supported on, on four main pillars on one side of the space and four pillars on the other side. You see the a long section here. 
and underneath this shed you had a large, a large plaza with uh, uh, auditoriums underground and, and garage underground, which is not seen here, telecommunication centers, um, and the structure itself could be used for people to walk inside. You see the on this photo montage, we try to relate the building to the content, indicate that this was the, uh, the, the generating point for revitalizing the, the whole area and for uh, converting and saving all the Victorian warehouses around it. The, I think that, so unfortunately we didn't uh, get this project built, it was an ideas competition, I have no idea what uh, it's on on the site at the moment, but uh, I think it wasn't uh, a, an unrealistic idea at all. Um, if Liverpool had built this sort of structure as a landmark and they could have done it just by you know, financing it with a concert by the Beatles, uh, I think they've had, they would have had by now a tremendous landmark which would have really acted as, as, as a catalyst for the, for the area. This uh, image, of uh, this high-tech image, is not uh, a value in itself. I think we used it because, uh, first of all, it's associated with something we found in, in the context. Uh, let's see if I can get a better picture of that. You see the, this type of steel uh, trust beams um, of the early, early, early 19th century uh, were really part of the context of these uh, massive warehouses not far from the, from the harbor. Also, this type of structure was tied to the idea of the of pop music, we felt, the, the, the idea of the theater, of, of, of big pop or rock concerts. And uh, there was also some historic memory, probably, even some, uh, uh, something like this, which I found quite by chance during an, uh, in an exhibition at the, in Paris at the Babourg Center was a, a model, a very large model, uh, done by a group of, uh, of students in, uh, in early this century in Moscow. It was on the theme of the city as a theater. And you see this huge structure, which is in fact a, a multifunctional structure serving as a, as a big theatrical space. And uh, I think we, uh, we had the same imagery in mind <clears throat> uh, for another project. It was another competition um, of a very different character. It was an, an architect developer competition. Um, so it had to be very realistic. It had to be a very, uh, very economically designed. Um, it was a competition for a sports palace in uh, San Benito del Tronto, uh, along the Adriatic coast. And so the first, uh, well, one, one of the major ideas we had um, was that we should have a very light structure as a roof, uh, made up of, uh, of steel beams in this case, um, but lifted up on the main supporting vertical structure by this strip of lighting so that it would really look like a floating um, infrastructure, not just a roof, but uh, a, a structure which uh, was served, served for carrying lighting, um, all the acoustical uh, services, and uh, in a sense it would feel as it were in a large open space. And uh, so a large part of the design concentrated in, the, in devising this uh, 
<clears throat> these uh, big beams, which uh, have a span of about uh, well, four, nearly 50 meters, it means uh, much. Um, uh, yes, 100, 100 feet, uh, 150 feet, 160 feet about, yes. And uh, <clears throat> we're based on a 45 degrees geometry, uh, 10 feet high, and we're all pre-assembled in a factory near Perugia, then dismantled, uh, sent to the site, and, and reassembled on top of the uh, on top of a reinforced concrete structure. Now, another very important aspect of designing a, a sports palace like this, which holds about 4,000 people, is the circulation. Um, and um, obviously, we provided uh, all the horizontal and, and um, vertical circulation required by the codes. Uh, so the uh, the corners, but we, did, we used the type of sister staircase, which was very we found was very um, e efficient in terms of um, use of space. On the other hand, we spent more space than we would actually be required to on this sort of corridor up here, uh, which we tried we tried to treat as an urban element almost as a, an arcade where people could stop and chat after the match or after the shows because this is a sport palace which is also used for um, non-sport events such as uh, public meetings or uh, conferences and uh, so we provided also uh, points where people could look outside now, outside, there isn't very much to see, actually, in the sense that the uh, it's a it's a very um, it's a very isolated site. Although it's uh, very close to the coast of the Adriatic Sea, it's cut off from uh, from the beach by the railway, by the, the roads, by uh, rows of uh, ugly blocks, and uh, we tried to create a uh, rather uh, closely knit monumental compound because uh, just facing the, the sports palace we had uh, the football stadium also being built uh, with another competition which we didn't enter and um, so we we managed to persuade the council to create a plaza in between, between these two buildings so that it would form uh, an urban space with some uh, coherence in between. Uh, well, the technology, as I said, uh, was very simple because we had to keep the cost down. There was a major constraint of the design. And we employed a very, very simple uh, prefabricated system of um, um, uh, as, as a reinforced concrete a frame partly pre-stressed and this simple uh, concrete panel of two meters module and employing this module and this uh, prefabricated structure was a very interesting discipline in, um, in planning this building because it was a real major constraint in the design also of the, of the elevations. Now I also tried to, um, to use painting in a way to study this architectural concept and formal concepts. And I started a series of paintings in uh, 1978 uh, on, on the theme of uh, the city and architecture. I'm sorry, the one on the left is a bit dirty. It's not like that in reality. Um, now, the idea behind these uh, paintings is that uh, there is a basic geometry uh, the square and the 45 degrees in this case, and uh, a precise module which represents uh, a primary structure, uh, what would be a primary structure in an architectural uh, form, 
or represents an urban structure, if you like. And within this uh, primary structure, there are secondary elements, each one with its own color. Um, and the combination of the secondary elements suggests some uh, architectural forms, such as the repetition of the triangles may suggest a staircase, and the addition of uh, um, other uh, trapez trapezoidal forms so it may suggest the idea of roofs or, uh, or structures and arcades. And then <clears throat> I've started inserting in between the structure also some uh, more um, uh, realistic, so to speak, elements, uh, which are the most clearly identifiable architectural elements. See, as you would find in, um, in a historic context, you would find a mixture of uh, clearly recognizable historic elements and then uh, within the same pattern, uh, the addition of, of other elements gradually more abstract. Um, as you see in here in this painting on the right, the representation of the what is for me the essence of the Japanese house. Its primary structure, uh, it's a simple geometry, the sliding screens, the big roof, and the relationship with the outside space. And I think that the use of color is also important uh, together with form to suggest um, the sense of a place. And I did this painting after uh, a holiday in Ischia, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea near Naples. Um, so the, the colors are quite different here. You see these uh, strong pinks and whites, and also domes and, uh, and arches. Again, on, on the theme of the how to respond to a context, this was a, um, a frame I found in the loft, perhaps uh, uh, 18th century. And I filled in the missing piece here by trying to reconstruct some of the geometry and the colors which I found in, in the frame itself. And on the right, it's a uh, sort of experiment or suggestion of uh, this uh, relationship, not uh, with the historic context and architectural form, but between architectural form and, and nature, with two quite separate and distinct characters. Uh, this uh, type of geometrical studies also become themes in uh, architectural composition. Uh, this is a recent project for a house um, on the hillsides of, of Perugia, which was designed on the concept of a, of a regular grid. I have a very regular structural grid. You can see it here, uh, forming regular volumes of space. And uh, these volumes were interlocked with each other and with the hillside. And, and, w and then within uh, the volumes there were some uh, volumes taken away or volumes added according to the uh, needs of the family, the actual functional needs. And unfortunately, we couldn't. Uh, carry on that project, since it was rejected by the planners um, for a series of reasons. And we had to redesign the house completely. And the, so the new version required, uh, first of all, a big retaining wall. It was what the planners wanted. They wanted a big retaining wall to separate the, the ground from the house to make it uh, inhabitable. 
And um, at the beginning, I was horrified by the idea. But in fact, retaining walls can become part of the architecture uh, as they are in uh, historic hill towns. If you go to Assisi, for instance, near Perugia, you'll find that the basic urban form is based on the retaining walls the Romans built. Uh, so there's still the idea of the very regular uh, frame and the, the identical volumes added up. Uh, but there is also the idea of the, of the walls. Sorry, oh, I've still got the voice. Of the series of walls running along the contours, the wall here and down there and another wall over there and then overlapped to the system of volumes and walls. There is this pavilion, which gives some, um, makes a vertical counterpoint to the horizontality of the walls. And you, see all, <clears throat> you also see the employment of the geometry of the square and 45 degrees and of the circle as a way of terminating the walls where the the road goes down and wraps around. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the plans here, uh, the ground floor plan where you have the entrance. Now this was designed as a uh, as two units, two separate units, uh, but they can also be joined together in various ways. Along this corridor, you can open up this party wall and add one bedroom or two bedrooms to this unit. So, in fact, it's a, it's a system, it's a geometric system which also works in a way to give uh, fle flexibility and adaptability to the plan. Um, I, uh, I'm very fa fascinated by the colors and the geometries used by Giotto was the, as you know, a medieval painter. He painted these frescoes in Assisi. This is, in fact, it's a representation of Assisi itself. Uh, these walls and these towers. Uh, the geometries I employed in the paintings and uh, in the in that house, uh, I tried to employ also for uh, designing this piece of furniture. This was just before leaving Italy this summer, <clears throat> and employing the, this was a reception desk for a dentist, actually. And uh, it's a big counter made of three interlocked volumes. You have the, the top of the counter here, then the, the, main, uh, the main desk behind, and the two legs on one side. And uh, also, I started studying a series of uh, uh, children furniture, um, such as these tables and elements such as this, which can be uh, made up of different components, one, two, three, and a combination of others, um, as really toy furniture. And uh, then uh, employing the same a geometry on something which is in between, really, um, interior architecture and, and furnishing and painting. For, uh, it's a sort of mezzanine or you know, bunk beds. Okay. And uh, I think I, I like the triangle also because, in a sense, it uh, uh, represents my intellectual movements between uh, three uh, <clears throat> different aspects of my activity, which is uh, painting and research and design. So I keep moving between painting, research, and design, and back to painting. And it's, uh, it's not an easy process, but I hope that uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be fruitful in the long term. Thank you.